All right, here we are on uh, Central Front series, the story so far. Not much changed. Uh, last turn was the first turn the Soviets did not have air superiority, and it really slowed their attacks. Uh, and then they were still able to gain ground, though, and to create further problems for the NATO line where NATO had to, you know, move back and cover some more territory. Let's take a quick look at where the strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, I better turn that off. Making an omelet and, well, I've made it now, but uh, it might burn if I, I leave it there. And then I realized, wow, I didn't do the story so far. Okay. Um, what were we going to say? Uh, the line runs along here. Not much change, mainly a consolidation in preparation for multi-hex attacks. These units here, everything is kind of an iffy supply. We're going to see they're, they're not going to be, I mean, things are going to flip over, but they're going to gain a hit in exchange for it. If we see anything on its white side still, it's completely, uh, it's completely a problem. I have not gotten to the big flip yet. Uh, cutting up here, we're getting close to the Nuremberg region. Again, the Soviet plan is largely set up multi-hex battles at this point. Try to break a hole where we can and, you know, exploit it. But we're not going to see those massive, you know, penetrations anymore. It's not really possible. Up here, we've got... Uh, the airborne units, now I cheated and destroyed uh, one of the units there. I don't feel like, I didn't feel like undoing it, I don't know. Here again we have a supply problem, but this is mainly a NATO supply problem. I think the Soviets have got their supply in place coming down through this road. They managed to push things closer there. Uh, likewise, here we might be in trouble. One, two, three, four. No, we make it. Okay. Um, cutting up here, we haven't made a lot of ground again, but we've clustered forces together to make bigger attacks and try to gain a hex or two. It's, it's beginning to kind of slow down to much more of an attritional uh, situation. Come up here, nice big gap that NATO is taking advantage of by covering very lightly. And then here in front of Frankfurt, uh, starting to get back into good, into the best terrain on this map, honestly. Uh, but Frankfurt itself right in front of it is very, very poor terrain for defense. Cutting across here, this is probably overly defended. Um, especially since it doesn't matter what happens here. And down, down. This ended up being a real problem. I probably should have pulled out last turn, but now I'm stuck with uh, a bunch of units that are gonna get destroyed. And then this big area of planes that, you know, once these are eliminated, there's quite a chance that the follow-up attacks are gonna cause real problems. This ground is gonna be given up no matter what. But the problem is, my staying in place meant that um, I'm probably going to have to fight in that planes before I give it up, and things may go a little bit worse for me. Nice little gap here, but then we come to the Soviet incursion, the furthest north on the uh, North German plains, uh, which is again, this is driven like. All the places where there's extreme advances, here I get, not over there, but here maybe, here, here, here. It's because I was leveraging another map. Uh, if I was playing one of these games as a, a standalone game, I wouldn't be able to get the kind of advances that we're getting on some of these maps. Um, and let's get the... Not much happened at all here. 
the Soviets chose not to push the attack. Dutch are coming in to fill in the gap, uh, to fill in over here and free up some of these other units. Uh, we got a little here, and then we got a mess of out of supply issues. Um, certainly for the Germans. Question is, are the Soviets in supply? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, four, five, six to this road. That gets me down to here and off map here, which is good enough. I can't go this way because of this unit. I got to clear up some of these units in the backfields, but I also, you know, <laughs> when I, <laughs> the, the focus has been on pushing forward constantly, and I am going to get reserve units uh, or reinforcements coming in. Um, I got poles coming in on this map, for example. I got a lot of reinforcements on this map. Time staggering issues that were in a uh, problem. Um, these guys are out of supply, though. This line is where this is where supply starts up again. And then we come over here, some more Dutch, and then uh, the Hamburg itself, which. You know, I'm not going to be able to bust my way through Hamburg at all easily. I'm trying to reduce some of the stuff in the area that's, uh, you know, that's on my side of the river and can't get away. But for the most part, uh, the only way to get this western portion of ha ha Hamburg, not Hanover, is to cut around this way. Hanover's not on here, is it? Central, probably further west. Oh no, there it is. All right. Most of the way through the big flip, uh, I did all the NATO and I'm coming back and still have one more map. It's still fucking backbreaking work. Um, I'm jumping in because I need to rest my back. I wanted to show, uh, but uh, I have something I wanted to show as well. But uh, also, tons and tons of one and two point counters returning to my pool. So, you know, <laughs> we're seeing the effects of the rest, right? Uh, but surprisingly, this guy is in supply, isn't he? Three to here, and then he can take the road up. Oh, maybe he's not. Nope. I thought he was in supply. <laughs> um, this US unit, which is right next to him. <laughs> and, you know, I'm thinking it cuts him off. But it actually cuts him off from this route to the airhead and then also from this route. Now, if I grab that, I can turn that into a functioning airhead as well. And then that also would be a supply source. So <laughs> it's just I haven't done that. <laughs> there was a helicopter or something there that ran away. That's part of it. So the big flip is uh, done and we rolled a five which gives NATO air superiority with a fog but the air superiority is cut in third so we only have 30 NATO air points. That's not a big deal. It means probably you know it's less likely I'm gonna have one of them funky little offensive operations where I'm like yeah, let's send a, a battalion in uh, with just a shit ton of air support. Um, which is what we saw. It was a battalion versus a battalion. You can't take a regiment out. You know, it's, it, it's really hard to hurt anything in this game, honestly. And then uh, EW points, well, NATO has as many as they need, basically. Which is one of the reasons why I'm not too upset that they they don't have more than than the Warsaw Pact is that they just don't need them. You know. Oh, what's this? This guy really. I think this is somebody I missed. Uh, maybe not. Four. He's not getting out anyway. He's not getting out anywhere. Is that thing used up? It's not. I gotta switch that to a three. Um, four, five, and then I don't find a road except here. Oh, that's clear, six. Yeah, that, 
that unit needs to be uh, recovered. Uh, sometimes you catch shit like that where there's just like something where it's obvious you did something wrong and there's probably ones where I missed where I didn't do something wrong. Anyway, uh, the important thing is where the Soviets have their points. Fifth Corps, they only have eight. Everywhere else, they're above 10. Uh, with uh, North German plane, the next small one at, at 11. I, again, I have no idea why these points are what they are. Um, this is, I got about a half hour before I got to play raid. I'm not going to do any more of this. This is so fucking backbreaking. I, I mean, <laughs> Obviously, if the video is any longer, I played more, but no, I mean today. Um, it, the big flip is such a painful thing. It is nice to have some counters back. I'm sure I'll find a way to uh, to use up a lot of them again, but I think, I think the major... So, I mean, here's the thing. Again, the Soviets aren't going to do much, which means I'm probably not going to be uh, accumulating a lot of counters. On, on, on stuff. So as long as uh, we don't get air superiority. Now, we get it half the time. A six isn't too terrible. It's no superiority. I'd really, you know, I really want superiority, but it's none whatsoever. I guess the fog's heavier. But the advantage of fog can be kind of cool because it means your mobile attacks, well, not without air superiority. I was going to say your mobile attacks. Uh, you can drop chemicals and that's all you need, but that doesn't really help. You still need to release the chemicals from, from artillery. I gotta check the chemical uh, uh, shifts. Is there a... Uh, there we go. Yeah, we get a couple more turns of two shifts. And then after that it goes to one. Now, the advances are, are, are fairly heavy. For, for these games, but when I put it in context of like the NATO game, I feel like I'm actually getting stopped maybe at an earlier point. We're looking at, this is day four right now, basically. And I don't remember. I don't remember um, how many days, what, what the scale of the turns is in that. You get the feeling it's like two days per turn. Um, so it actually feels like NATO stopped or slowed the Soviets down quicker on these than they did when I played the NATO game. If they're two day turns. If they're one day turns, it's probably about the same. <laughs> uh, there's just this nasty grinding period. All right, let me fix that guy and then I won't bother you anymore. At least not with this. Might do... I don't know. I, I've got a ways to go on the campaign rules in uh, Wild Blue Yonder still. Monday morning. Uh, about to start. I mean... Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty much morning. And my sleep has been very troubled. I, I listen to videos to fall asleep. And I'm listening to longer ones. And... They're kind of keeping me half awake the whole time. So I like, think I got like four hours of sleep in a couple of different little slots. Anyway, it's kind of weird because coming to this window every morning, seeing the game or every day or whatever, and it, it may be because I'm limited to playing during the day basically. Uh, makes me feel like I have to kind of greet you guys before I actually start playing uh, rather than, you know, try to do the greeting in the midst or whatever. Uh, I, you know, somebody was like, oh, I'm surprised you got this far. I am too, and I'm also consistently not sure if I should just stop. You know, <laughs> like, first of all, the different scenarios end at different times. This one lasts nine turns. This one lasted 12. This one lasts 10. These guys are like at least 14. But again, different time scale, right? 14, yeah. What did I say? It's like two thirds? 
Yeah, eight hours. No. They're eight hours instead of 12 hours, so it's like three quarter time. Uh, <laughs> so, somewhere in between the 10 and 12, whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I, I guess I keep pushing. Uh, in part because I'm not through OCS yet. I haven't even done the rolls for, uh, for a while, Blue Yonder. And I don't want to miss, I don't want to waste the big flip, right? But the problem is, I know that this turn is a waste. This turn is a wash for the Soviets. They're barely going to get anything off of it because they have no air power. And this is where I say the game becomes very random. The first four turns, you have Soviet air power guaranteed. After that, the number of turns that they get air power is probably highly determinate as to um, how far they get. And this was in a day, nowadays, um, games would probably give you some kind of, I, I'm thinking about things like unconditional surrender, right? Which kind of gives you a, oh, well, if the Soviets fall on this turn, then, you know, or if you attack the Soviets on this turn, you have this long and this, you know, to, for the war to come to a certain point and everything. Um, I'm thinking with this one, because this is such a key die roll for the weather, it's like the number of turns that you have air superiority would like impact your victory conditions. Because it's something completely outside your control. It's just a roll of a die, a single roll of a die for each turn. And it has a really, really significant impact on whether or not you can conduct any attacks. Start studying down here, trying to figure out, hey, do I want to launch an attack here? I don't have enough artillery, I don't have long enough range artillery to knock out his artillery support. And of course, the helicopter has got a, got a turn to basically recharge last turn. Um, that helped, you know. So few of them are in bad shape. Well, while I'm thinking these things, these thunks, They start considering something new. So far, Warsaw Pact has been all about just gain terrain. That's the victory conditions after all. But there's also the concept of force reduction. Uh, and we saw this with the French, where they had to attack uh, a single unit, right? And if I just hit the unit, it would run away and it would have no effect whatsoever. Now, I could just hit this unit and could run away, but it's kind of a beat up unit. Of course, it's, hit, it's beat up enough and it's German, so it won't run away right away, and, although that one would, but it has to take one hit. Um, that I can hit it and then hit it again and destroy it that way. But I could also send another unit around and guarantee its destruction and get just about as much, you know, uh, in terms of ground. So it's kind of an interesting choice. Well, now that I'm slowed down, do I want to start attritioning their pieces rather than just pushing as deeply as I can? Because it would slow me down a little bit. First of all, I attack with this, I get an advance, everything can come up behind. And, you know, that could mean follow up attacks and everything. But that everything that comes up behind is actually, you know, the main line <laughs> that I basically just need to pick on someone, set myself up for a multi hex attack against it, etc. Setting things up, I decided to let that unit escape if it wants to. Well, it did a little bit. I gained a little bit of ground, fourth tank pushing up uh, to make an attack against here. I don't have any engineers in the area, which is kind of a problem. Um, and then over here, here the attack failed because the EW failed. So four air points were thrown in. I had artillery, but it was a mobile attack and I fucked up.
Did I not? No. I gave him too many hits because it was a mobile attack. Forgot that it was after I <laughs> rolled, but calculated as if it was. Um, it was a mobile attack. Uh, it was stymied. I didn't use the helicopter in it, which would have solved the whole issue using air points, but mm, I'm a little worried because air points are low. But this was in kind of a weird position where, well, first of all, because it was a mobile attack. Uh, I felt air points or helicopter made more sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, kind of like picking my attacks, doing a little bit, inching forward, not trying to, not trying, not, not getting any great breakthroughs. Basically, this unit up in the lead was something of a breakwater preventing me from being in position to launch attacks. Now, I've moved the, the one division up further to make the attack here. This division's pushed up here to make an attack here. And then these guys are still in position to keep fighting there. And that's next turn, you know? But I'm just not expecting to gain the kind of ground that I used to gain. Uh, I'm hoping to inch forward a little bit at a time. Where I identify an attack I wanna make, say here, which could gain me quite a bit of ground, there's no question. It could be very good. Um, <coughs> if it retreats, and it won't, because it's German. Uh, there's a lot of artillery in this area. I can, not, I can deactivate some of the artillery, but I'm not sure that even makes sense. Like, I'd have to fire a couple of rounds from this thing. Which can't really help me otherwise, but I fire a couple of rounds from this thing to knock out a couple of these guns. But this gun, this gun, this gun, they're all still available. I, I think I'm just going to rely on the EW. I'm only going to make a limited number of attacks. Much less than the EW from what I can see looking at the board, looking at what uh, I actually want to hit. The main thing that's stopping me, that makes it so that I only launch one attack from a given location at a time is that I need to do these multi-hex attacks. So, sure, I spend my six ops points and then I don't budge the enemy. I didn't hear. He's close, but... Uh, took another hit, he'd have to retreat with a mobile attack, though. But uh, I got the EW. It was a good result. But I don't move the enemy and he's weak enough. I'd love to hit him again. But the actual unit isn't weakened, and I'm not allowed to continue with the multi-hex attacks. So that's it. You know, I spend my six ops points, and then I just set it down and say, that's the best I can do on a turn where I don't have air support. If I had air support, things would be a little different. <laughs> I could get, you know, more firepower on the line. I'm still fighting, you know, real units, but a two-point defense against mobile, eh, that, that I can beat up on, you know? So when, once you start getting up into those, those US and British units that are actually capable of holding their ground, the French, eh, they have some too, but they go to three-point mobiles. Eh. Again, you can probably handle them. <laughs> Another semi-successful attack here. I threw a whole hell of a lot in, even did some counter-battery fire, just in case to force them to use resources that they don't want to use, i.e. not just artillery, <coughs> in order to defend this hex. But this hex is key. The Germans refused to, to retreat from it um, because that would cut their supply line. I don't know how far back. I'm not sure. Eh. I think this stack is not in supply, but I think these guys were. And also, you know, it exposes some units behind the line there um, to an ugly situation. And I also don't want to open up supply to the uh, Soviet units that are kind of trapped behind me. 
One thing that I'm not doing is I'm not using any of my helicopters. And that may seem a little weird, but here's the thing. With me not having air support, air, air power, it means if I fail, well, among a number of things, it just makes it so likely there's a 50-50 chance that no matter what I do, even in a situation like this, NATO can throw in air points and get some hits on my helicopters. I'm being very, very careful of them, probably too careful. Uh, because I have a shitload of them back here. Uh, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, you know, six three-point helicopters that I could throw into, and, and they're especially important in mobile attacks where artillery is less valuable. Uh, same, same as air points uh, being important in those. But I'm just, I'm so terrified of taking, you know, a lot of hits on them and having that resource just taken away from me. When normally I can use them, well, first of all, they could be used as a defensive measure. Not that I really need defensive measures. There aren't a lot of places where I'm liable to be attacked. These guys, maybe, you know, maybe. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, as usual, it's kind of slow going, and I don't really, like, I don't really want to push on. Like, I don't want to go up here and do this and everything. I'm just, uh, I, I, I don't know why. Uh, I just consistently feel like, yeah, I need to break. Um, I've got another Czech division that was back here as a reserve heading up this way. I've got this non-divisional uh, non armored unit, which would be very useful wherever I put it but I don't have a wherever right now. And then I got another division back here. I'm holding off on deciding on both of these until I uh, handle the couple of divisions that are over here and see what they do. This is getting really ugly, especially with the mixed colors, but this, I saw this and I'm like, whoa, what are the French doing over there? Yeah, no, that's one of these stupid Czech units from the wrong color palette. Performed a couple of operations up here. First, the attack on this. I uh, lost air support. Still okay with what happened because I just had so much power uh, that even even with a, a couple of air points committed, I still did some damage. But you know, instead of just being blown away. It's still there, <laughs> is I guess the difference. Uh, and then I shifted units over to here. Now this is actually problematic. The guy who left uh, the training area, which I guess is where they're coming from when they reinforce onto this map, but I hadn't noticed it before, uh, would have just stacked them there and moved them out of there or something. Um, moved out of here to here. I'm actually out of supply here. But if I need to make any kind of attack on the French, I need to be able to push in, in that direction. And just, you know, it, once I clear this, this is really important. Then I've got this road, and I can supply off the highway there, or Audubon or whatever. But right now, I'm having to trace back this way. And everybody else can make it uh, to here. But this guy just can't quite, and this guy probably just can't quite, as he's basically in, if anything, a little worse position. Um, none of this cleared things up enough that I know what I want to do with these extra resources here, nor the re reinforcements that are coming in. You could say, well, look, dude, what's with this gap? Why don't, why don't you do something about that? Maybe. Um, one of the problems is there's double units stacked here and here, and that is just like, ugh, I don't want to face that. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, I should have something poised to exploit that if those units shift elsewhere. Um, they're probably in motion, which is why, uh, why they're where they are. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like I've sent enough resources up this way towards uh, Munich 
and I'm almost as crowded as it gets. Sure, I could I could push something through here, so maybe maybe it goes up this way. Um, But it just feels like I've got everything covered that I really want covered. So I don't know. I um, guess I'll just push these guys up. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the hell to do. Like, I, I want to go fucking <laughs> mush my brain playing raid or whatever. I think I'm going to have to take a nap. But uh, I had this incredible craving for tuna for a tuna salad sandwich, so I made that. I have like a, <laughs> my pile of boxes. These egg cartons I planned on burning, but I never burned them, but I bought like a, a couple of uh, boxes of tuna, like, you know, a pallet of them basically. <laughs> and uh, I mean, not like, you know, big pallet, just, whatever, whatever they ship into the stores or whatever, um, several years ago, and I'm kind of running down, I'm down to like four or five cans, I think. But uh, yeah, it was kind of cool because it was like the only thing I could order by mail that was like normal food. And for some reason, before, uh, before I, I think it's when I moved here, before I, uh, I realized that I could use the cart still here, and I was using the backpack, and I'm like, eh, any canned goods that I can get delivered, I want. Anyway, I have opened up another airhead, and that allowed me to ship another unit in, move down here, cancel out these artillery. That's going to let me um, operate a little further over, although I still have some guns uh, to try to knock out and whatnot, but... You know, I just keep chunking more into here. But honestly, more reinforcements on Don out front isn't going to do me a hell of a lot of good right now. Uh, what I, it's going to take so many turns to get there that this scenario will be over. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, just shipping, shipping in more, more and more uh, units. I am only allowed to supply two regiments from there. Uh, the question is always, hey, you know, do I have a line of supply? Right now, this guy has a line of supply. These are just artillery, so this guy actually has a line of supply going up to there. These aren't gonna last, but I'm just trying to fuck with uh, uh, whatever's in the backfields uh, by, by enough that like NATO can't hold Nuremberg effectively anymore. Closing in on the city here. Uh, this unit, big attack, took out the remains of that big unit. I got a couple of lucky shots, uh, no, no e EW uh, interference. We were able to get our EW in for attacks here that gained a hex and here that gained a couple of hexes. That's all we're getting now. But now things get interesting. I come to this 51st tank, some of which is committed up here. But swinging it this way would do me a lot of good. It would basically throw Nuremberg into hell, maybe connect me up to the air supply uh, so that I don't need it anymore, so that I got the roads running up there. So that's where I kind of want to go, but I also feel like I want to start working from this side, just to make sure. I, I could actually just start from here, honestly, but that would confuse me because <coughs> I'm easily confused. By the way, I threw a helicopter into that last fight, which is a little risky, but again, I'm, I'm kind of wasting resources by not using them at all. <coughs> but. I think I want to see more of what's going on, and if I, I, if I could get all the way up to here, that would be fantastic. I don't know if I can get that far before I decide, yeah, let me switch back to the Hof Gap map. Um, but right now, this is a very confused situation, and I want to let that bake for a while. 
which means I think it's time for me to take a break. Uh, I kind of want to take a nap anyway. I didn't get enough sleep. I know I'm not playing much, but that's life. So I rested for about an hour or so and feel a little better. Um, before I move away from this sector of the board, I pulled these reinforcements in. They came in at one of the three rail heads. I brought them in here so, again, they'll be closer to the, rest, to, to the unit that I, I, I landed. So I don't have to, you know, if I do connect up, I don't have to shift everything over. I, I probably could say, hey, this isn't that bad either, but this is where I'm likely to break through is in this area rather than over here where I think uh, the defenses look very strong right now. What we're gonna end up seeing though is that these couple of units are gonna get stripped away, things might shift up there because that's easier terrain than maybe the, the cities along the river, whatever. Um, so I don't know, this could break. But right now it looks pretty solid. So I think I'm gonna shift in this way. And that means I start considering the North German plane. First thing I actually look at over here is this clump over up here, because this is where I'm gaining the most. It looks sparsely defended. Is there anything I can do there? Well, I'm not in direct contact with the enemy. And I've been finding I need to be in contact with my multi-hex battles, etc. So I'm gonna have to set those up. Yeah, there might be an attack here. I doubt it. We're looking at, that's a three point in the swamp. I could get 12, 13, 14 against three. That's not terrible odds. It's also not great. Right? <laughs> that's getting me to around three to one in the marsh, right? That's not a table I wanna fight on. I would have to throw a lot of firepower in. No, I can get three shifts off the smoke and chemicals that gets me to here which is still not good that's out at you know six to one in the marsh which is four to one in the plains I'm gonna have to throw a lot of points in I don't have a hell of a lot of points but maybe if I have a lot of helicopters kicking around yeah, not that one um, that I want to risk and I do have some down here uh, maybe it makes sense to try to try to push against that. And actually I have some over here, which are probably closer. <laughs> I don't know, I may rethink this. This is a US unit, it has no artillery supporting it. This is British up here. The colors are a problem. But I did choose to make an attack on here and actually hit it twice because I'm not using the multi-hex advantage. Now I used up some of my helicopters on it. I used up gas and, and whatever, artillery from back here. I had to do some counter battery over here. Uh, but I managed to do quite a bit of damage by getting two attacks in with EW support on, you know, the sixth level. I picked off because I saw something outside that doesn't make much sense, but um, there's people working in the street. They've been cutting my internet sporadically. Uh, they're, they're working on upgrading the uh, infrastructure for, for the viral, for, for, the, uh, for the network and the cable and whatnot. Um, I got warning about it, but you know, I've been kind of like, wow, it was kind of a fucked up day. It would be, uh, it would have been a good day to go out. It's just, it's so not pretty out. I don't know. <laughs> like, and I was so tired. Um, I looked at this again. No, this is in the marsh. Sure, this was in the city, but I actually, I had an extra armored unit on here, one of those littler armored units that adds another four strength points, which is really the big difference. I'd have to throw a lot more firepower in here to be able to budge this um, with mobile attack, even though both of these have a mobile defense of three, and that's what I was operating off of. Uh, what is kind of weird here though, this is a unit of the Sixth Guard. The Sixth Guard is kind of spread out all over Hell and Creation. Um, I've got some of it up here, some of it here. 
most of that's not moving or doing anything. Another unit could have taken advantage if I had managed to budge this, and I came close. Those French unit, uh, sorry, Dutch units are nearly destroyed. Pushed the English back a little bit here with the 12th Guard tank. Uh, thing is, I did uh, pin this artillery, and it may, have, you know, may have difficulty getting out of there. Uh, but the thing that, that's um, screwed up now. This is the rest of the 12th Guard tank down here. I, I can't make attacks down here. Um, you know, four to one in the city is shit. Even if I bring the engineer that I forgot about over, from over here back down or another one up or something. Um, which means I think I start working around here Eventually we'll get done with this map and then see what we can do on other maps <laughs> to see if we can make it all the way over there. Got a little bit further. 21st Division attacked here. Uh, these guys are 35th. Okay. Uh, that gets me. These 35th, I believe, are out of supply. It's not obvious. Let's take a look at the, the easy guy first. One, no. You can't get there. So yeah, you could go one, two, three, four, five, six. This guy's in supply. This guy actually probably is not, but I may have just established that supply. I think I certainly treated him as if he was out of supply. So I'm gaining something. I don't know what, and I don't really know how. I think this guy was in supply before and I ignored it. But that kind of gets this sector here. I come over here, there's nothing. Um, I doubt I'm set up to start busting through here. This is a mess. But I gotta, I gotta figure it, you know. Um, but I should have enough artillery, et cetera. And by the way, this attack uh, that I just made against this unit was... I lost my EW, but I still got good results off of it and got to a good odds table, actually, which is a sign that NATO's kind of wasting their air points. They're down to 18, though, so it's kind of shaky. It's like, eh, should I have just ignored that, you know, <laughs> or, God forbid, sent a helicopter in there. The helicopter would have gotten all chewed up, though. Um, but, yeah, now I have to go to this gnarly mess. Now, I... Pretty sure I mentioned this before, but I'm covering this in a lot more detail than I usually cover war games. I have the fear that I'm going to do the same with OCS. That something has, uh, and when I say war games, I mean these operational, well, all war games in general, but these operational games, I usually just kind of look and give you the, the picture of where the front lines move to and whatever. I'm going into a lot of detail, and I don't know why. Uh, it's just something in my mood right now, and some of that mood is why I'm enjoying it, so, you know, let it be. <laughs> I know other people are commenting, saying they're really enjoying this one, which may be because I'm, like, enjoying it more and focusing more on the individual aspects. Or maybe not, I don't know. I decided to attack with those elements of the 35th, and because I was pretty sure I could guarantee I had like a 40 to 2 after neutralizing the artillery. Because uh, it was very, very, it only needed one hit in order to be uh, just a one defense unit. Um, so that was a huge attack. But it's like, well, that's a waste to use air power on. So I didn't even use an EW on that. Then I did a follow through attack on here, which maybe I shouldn't have. My EW failed. I ended up doing a hit, so it wasn't that bad. I took an artillery uh, uh, a, a chemical release um, in, order, in order to make the attack. But now I'm in supply with both units and I've cleared out a little problem. And we're kind of putting a, a squeeze on things. I gotta be careful. I almost tried to use these one guard tank artillery to support uh, an actual fight. They, I could have, and I think I did, I actually could have used it 
Let me, let me exchange a point um, from back here because I intended to use it for counter battery fire and I should have been able to get away with that. So what truly is Chrome, the Polish unreliability rules. I launched an attack here. I already resolved the attack and then realized, wait a minute, I forgot the rules. Um, first of all, combat results are doubled against the Poles, which is terrible because they're taking some here. But also they have to roll on the Polish unreliability table for each of their stacks at current FP level. Now current FP level on both of these is zero. The results I got are a 1-2, which is reduced to a 1-1 one, because one, it was a mobile attack. But if I got the odds wrong, I got it wrong. So first this stack and then the other stack. Okay, they both fought. So now I'm gonna take two hits on these two stacks, which, you know, is less than ideal. The Poles are not really happy to be here. <laughs> I think I'll be learning a lesson. Yeah, I got a lot of Polish units, but I can't really use them for much. And maybe they get committed to the mop-up actions, I don't know. They can be used in breakthroughs and stuff. They can be additional weight that you follow up, and they're fine on defense. Well, maybe not fine because all combat losses are double. <laughs> but there is no real defense for, for the Warsaw Pact. Like, they're just not, they're too, units are too big to fight for the most part. Anyway, not a pleasant, pleasant result there. Um, by the way, the real reason I turned it on, I'm using some of my smaller pipes that I didn't used to use, that I haven't been using much at all. When I'm sitting in my chair at the computer and I don't want to keep having to get up. Uh, when I'm playing in the loft or in the basement, it's a long walk to refill my pipe. <laughs> and these need refilling a little bit more often. But I used to smoke these in Phoenix uh, a fair amount of, of the time when I was playing games. Simply because I take the pipe out of my mouth a lot of the times. And it wastes less tobacco with these guys. Like... They go out quicker, basically, <laughs> without burning up as much. Moving down into Hamburg itself, we've had a lot more, uh, better success. I made an attack this way against uh, basically out of ammo, wrecked artillery piece, boom, gone. Uh, but I also attacked uh, this hex, I think. Yeah, with all this shit. And actually, this guy could be used to advance. I want to get him out of there and towards some place where he could be useful. He's non-divisional and he's not really doing me much good uh, over here anymore. He was. He was important for a moment and that moment's done. I freed this all up and now uh, I think he can... Let me think what his advance is. It's a five hit. I don't know. I got like a couple of hexes. Um, that's most of this map. I got some reserves. I got some stuff in the background that I probably want to move. And then another look here, see how I want to position those for next turn. The dead pile is actually not too bad. We're doing a better job this time. Um, like, remember last turn, we killed like three units total. I'm getting more used to, well, Okay. I set up better for I'm not going to have air superiority <laughs> because I had a turn without it. So I wasn't just plunging ahead at, at, at the kind of breakneck speeds um, that I've gotten used to. And, you know, by consolidating, trying to set up singular attacks, now I'm beginning to get, yeah, maybe not the dead piles I was getting when I had air superiority, but also when I just lost it. It was, uh, it was much weaker. I kind of wish the game just swung air superiority. It said the Soviets have it for the first four turns. Maybe the next couple turns, they may or may not get it, but then they lose it. You know, it, sure, it's still there's a there would still be a die roll on those couple of turns or whatever. But the way it is with 50-50, and honestly, I have a better chance than NATO does of getting air superiority still. But with it at 
uh, that I have it. It's like, it really feels like this incredible randomness, even if there are more turns that I'm rolling for, and therefore the luck is kind of more mitigated. I could get a string of really terrible luck, you know, <laughs> and it, it would be much, much worse than, I don't know. But anyhow, um, that's just from kind of a gameplay aspect. I can kind of understand the idea that since you don't have control of this, yeah, it's not a bad idea from a simulation aspect to say. It's just one of the factors you don't have control over and you have to roll a die for it. But it's a big die roll. You know, it's funny. Um, I'm entering here at the railhead with my reserve division. <sighs> Everything on this map moves with limited amount of movement points. But for all the Soviet units, they have full movement points, which may be a much larger number uh, under the rules that I'm playing. So like the reinforcements coming in for the Dutch are coming in slow, a little bit slower than Soviet forces do on this map. On this map, the Soviets are coming in with slower movement points. <laughs> I don't know what the hell is going on, but they tell you how many movement points each unit has. Here they're just assumed to have full movement points. Whatever that is for this map, it's probably like 8 instead of 12, and I'm moving them the full 12 because I'm aligning it with the rest of the system. But yeah, since I didn't, uh, since I didn't fix the reinforcement charts nor look up you know, what they should be, but... The countermix may be wrong, right? Like the countermix that I have from 2014 or whatever may have gotten corrected. <laughs> and therefore, I would have a hellish problem there as well. Uh, pushing that Soviet division up into this uh, clump here, maybe to relieve the poles or whatever. But you know, they got their own problems. Like that's just so fucking crowded, I can't cope with that. So I'm sending them all up this way to try to push uh, through here. This is actually looking like a very weak uh, situation right now. And if I can, in fact, I might not even want, might be clearing this, this road hex is more important than clearing this mountain hex, which I have a division set up to do. Why don't I do this? I could actually put it here. Um, cause I think getting this clear and then making my way up and into this gap is actually probably the most important. I, I have enough here already, right? <laughs> I've diverted so much off the Bayor map into here. Really all of this is actually down to here is old style counters. That's stuff that doesn't belong on this map. So the North German Plains is taking a big hit as to what's showing up on it. We come over here instead, and what we see is that the Donau front has extended, eh, not really. We're actually pretty good here in terms of keeping the units that belong on the original maps, uh, but really on the Hof Gap map on it, and the units that belong in the Donau front on it, with the exception of the French who are having to uh, run over and cover. Germans, it's hard to tell because all the German units got replaced by the, uh, by the moves issue and those counters have been uh, regurgitated or whatever. But yeah, this map is holding out pretty damn well actually considering the amount of Soviet effort that's pushed into it. Now, a significant amount is pushed into the Bayor map as well and it's really... You know, it's really the fifth core map that's the sparse one. And I've been mentioning that uh, again and again. But I think we're more or less done with this map. I may come back, move a unit or two, if there's anything, you know. I look at something like this and I'm like, I could shift it, but 
you know, it's already got a hit against it, and if I'm going to do any kind of operations, maybe it'll be useful. One, two, three, four. It can, you know, lend some fire support or something. So leave it behind. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but chances are that I'm more or less done with my attacks. Uh, we have so far, with taking out two maps, we have taken more than half the NATO air units. Obviously, we've used up, you know, on those maps, much of our EW. But not that much, honestly. Um, if we look at it, the North German plane is down to only three EW. I did a lot of attacks here. But, uh, you know, Donau Front's at seven. Fifth Corps we didn't hit yet. Hoff Gap is still above ten, although we've barely touched that map. Um, it's about time for raid. You know, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned, somebody, somebody else asked about RAID again, one of the regular viewers, uh, is this stupid mobile game that I play on my computer, basically. Uh, I mean, it, it plays on both, but it's like, it's a stupid little gotcha game. And uh, I was going to go, it's sort of a meme as well, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I was going to go um, and, and, and do a video on it. And I actually recorded, thought I recorded one. The problem was my screen capture video thing that I did for it um, had like a limit, uh, I don't know what it was, maybe two minutes or something. It was really ridiculously small. And I, 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 I was thinking I was recording it for a good 40 minutes or something. And I come back and there's almost nothing there. Uh, I grabbed the demo version of something. I didn't realize it only allowed two minutes. Um, and it's just, you know, videoing screen capture, but it could have linked it to a video camera. And I think I actually had that hooked up and was doing that so that I was like in a corner. Maybe not, uh, because I didn't really think that was that important. But anyway. We've made our way uh, to here on this map. We've made our way to here, more or less. It's giving a lot of these units a rest. The artillery, who cares? Uh, I, I, I might reposition the artillery for a better attack on this, but I might not because, I don't know. Because <laughs> I might forget. Um, but yeah, I think I can move on to the bearer map next. And it's kind of interesting because the Bayor map, the only thing, I've got like a division heading, I should have kept the light on it. Uh, I've got like a division heading uh, in this general direction. I think its intention is to bust up this way, provide a little bit more support. Because if I'm gonna make any breakthrough at all on this side of the Bayor map, it's gonna be based on the North German plane. It's gonna be based on, you know, working my way around. Uh, Hanover is not going to be trivial to take. And as we can see here, hey, this is a mess and it might be, go very badly um, for NATO, but <laughs> it's also going to be a tough fight. Everything up here is going to be a tough fight. I, I mean, this is all just horrible terrain for the attacker. Um, so in some ways, I'm kind of looking at this kind of diversion across the Lane River as being maybe my optimal way of getting anywhere in BR. Now, it doesn't get much better. Once I get up to the Vesser, there's a bunch of little cities up here that, you know, are as good to defend as that shit. So, I don't know. Here it is Wednesday. I know that because I pulled the garbage off. Uh, it gets so kicked around in terms of dates, times, whatever, now that I have no, no real regular schedule uh, other than raid. Um, and I've also been being, uh, been being um, disordered because of uh, uh, Wild Blue Yonder which is getting to be really complex in terms of balancing it and the camera. And I'm getting up at stupidly late hours for whatever reason. Hey, pray that my internet 
has settled down. It seems fine now. It's always fine during the day. They seem to fuck around at night. And here, here's the weird thing. Um, I got a notification from RAID that I was logging in from a different device or, or something. And that was in Milwaukee. <laughs> However, that was my currently active session that I was playing at the time. So whatever they're doing with these, uh, you know, I think they're like doing a hop to Milwaukee and God knows what they're doing with this. But they're doing something as a patch around to get us through while they're like working on the main line or whatever. And uh, it may explain why we're getting shitty reception at night is that when they click that into place or whatever, it's, um, it's not able to hold loads uh, of any kind. I don't know. I don't know what they're, they're doing. I don't know what their issue is. I did hear some banging away at the box at various times last night. So who, who the hell? All right. But anyhow, it's time to move, uh, move some more Warsaw Pack units. I got my coffee. I just made an omelet and ate that. Here it is, my morning, which is like, I don't know, it's like 2.30 real time, 3.30 mine. Let's get going. Pushed the 50th Guard Division across the lane to try to take this and clear another path <coughs> so maybe we end up with Hanover surrounded. And that's its own little thing, so I want to hold that. That's really more over here on the North German plane map. Not making any attacks, just getting myself in position. I don't have air power. It's too dangerous. All right, beyond what we talked about, the 10th Guard tank has made its way across here, and then the 20th tank and the 207th uh, mechanized, I guess, um, are concentrating on sort of attritional fights here. I mean, they're going to break through eventually, but these guys are holding out pretty hard against them. They had to do some counter battery, obviously. And there's like a 20th tank up here for some reason. Uh, but you know, the key is we didn't manage to break through and get here. Now, I think NATO has to withdraw this turn. And if this guy can't get out, it's too bad for him. <laughs> um, and to me, that kind of may mean uh, just giving up Hanover as a defensive position. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I could shunt over. There's no question there. All kinds of weird shit going by today. Okay. Um, and so that gets us more or less up to here. I still do have another division to bring in on this board. The last of the original board units to do so. And then I got this ugliness. But, you know, like here, I'm going to pick away, shoot things up. Um, the problem is, so the Soviets have a numerical advantage where if things go right, they can rest some units while other units press the attack. But when you get to places like this where you're tied into battle and, and, and when you have to do the set piece battles because you don't have air power or whatever, you're in this situation of, well, you know, my units are starting to get mauled, too, from the fighting. So, like, these guys are just as bad off as this is. These guys are fresh. Um, but that's, you know, that's okay. Uh, if, if I need, need a recovery turn, I can take it. I wasn't in a position where I was going to lose the units. And I need to clear this bottleneck as quickly as possible. So, you know, if I make an attack and it's a fairly good one like this one was... I actually gained some ground on that unit. And once this is open, there's maybe another division that can come through. Of course, I'm kind of using everybody on the line there. So this discussion doesn't really matter, except that I have this possible reserve division. You know, I might push forward if those guys do get their breakthrough and then be able to do the work and let these guys recuperate from the big fight that they were in. Again, going to the Ukraine war, if you think about like, 
you know, how much fighting, say, the Wagner group was doing in the Bakhmut region, where they were just, you know, continuously pounding and fighting their way in. If anything, this game is a little too sanguine about the ability to break through a, an enemy defensive position. Now, granted, Ukraine was throwing a lot of troops into there, so it would be more, you know, it would be a different kind of situation. But you can see some of the resilience of some of these more modern units in, in you know, the recent circumstances. And I, I think, uh, I think it kind of makes sense that the game works the way it does and that, you know, maybe <coughs> our Wargamer's view of um, how this military operation would have unfolded is a little different from, from what the military view was at the time. I'm assuming that camps had access, you know, to fairly, uh, to fairly important intelligence type. I mean, not like top secret type stuff, but was just in the right communities to be able to, uh, uh, to be able to produce this. Because the wargaming community at that time, and probably at, at all times, has always had sort of links in. And, you know, they could pass ideas by and not be given top secret information or whatever, but be given kind of a, uh, yeah, you know, they're falling a little faster than we would think they would in this situation or something along those lines. Outside, uh, second time today, <coughs> uh, because I have this little, uh, this little garbage thing over here. My mom used to have something like it, where she would just put the coffee grinds. But I put basically all my food garbage in there, eggshells, all kind of stuff like that. Um, and I kind of, I do what I guess is called pit compost, or sorry, uh, trench composting, where I just, it feels more like little pits because I just basically dig up what's, you know, a little hole in my yard here, there, and everywhere and dump the crap in there and cover it up and whatever. And sure, some animals will get at it. Uh, that's great, you know. Um, it's not something you can do if you have, you know, a lawn like that over there, but I don't. I have a forest floor. So it's, you know, perfectly fine for me to dig little little holes here, here there, and everywhere. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things that saves me from having to put out so much garbage, although there's not a hell of a lot that goes in there. Again, it's mainly coffee grinds and uh, tea bags. Um, and, you know, the tea bags, they may break into fibers that are kind of nasty or something. I don't know. Um, so, uh, the cheap ones are paper. The more expensive Tetley ones, I'm not so sure about. But I know they break into tiny little fibers, which I don't think do much harm. You know, they might get eaten, but they'll, they're going to pass through, right? <laughs> I've eaten worse than that. And my stomach knows that by this point in my life. Um, but uh, while I was out there, I don't know where this is going. I just want to talk. Um, I realized just how much crap that the pine trees drop. Um, not just needles. They drop a lot of needles. Needles are fine. No big deal. They drop tons and tons of pine cones. Okay. They got to reproduce, whatever. But they also seem really, like, willing to just drop whole limbs and stuff like that in a way that other trees kind of seem reluctant to do. There's just a hell of a lot of, uh, uh, you know, wood that comes down every time it rains or whatever. It's kind of interesting. Very different from, you know, sure, I had pine trees where I lived, but I wasn't living in the midst of a pine forest, right? We're getting to this messy shit here. Here, I just moved up into place. I have some, you know, slightly damaged units. I'm not going to budge him this turn, so I put more force on there. I might get, you know, the attritional advantage, but fuck it. 
he's undamaged right now. There's no real reason for me to hit him. Uh, I look at this. This is a big fucking unit. I don't think I want to hit it. But this is a 47th uh, guard tank over here. They're up here. Whereas down here is the 29th guard tank. I think I'm going to focus on trying to get this guy out of the way. Because this guy's just too fucking tough. At least he's not healing though. I don't know about that. I look through this entire region and I'm like... Geez, I just don't have the numbers. I just don't have the numbers. Um, part of the problem is, so here's 20th tank, guard tank here. 47th is over here across the river. I wouldn't be able to throw that in, which is fine. I don't have an engineer anyway up here. Uh, over here, it's going to be two, to, two units to one again because I've just got things set up wrong. I need to... You know, I, I, I don't even have an easy way to fix that without withdrawing. And I'm kind of like, uh, what the fuck have I done? I've created a mess that, you know, is kind of just a roadblock at this point. And then it gets annoying up here. And this is because there's no real distinguishment between the units in terms of like a very easy way to see the divisional other than by reading these, which, you know, on the camera, they're they're pretty easy to see. but. My eyesight has trouble, so like I got 6th guard tank and 8th guard tank next to each other. Those numbers look very similar to me. <laughs> um, yeah. I've had this issue before where, you know, I just have no, uh, units that are similar number. Now these guys have not intermingled in any sense, but they're very, very fucking close, actually. Uh, I don't know, the 8th guard tank looks like it's heading this way. And sixth guard tank is up this way, but you know, it's just what ended up in the areas and it's really tough to distinguish them. Eh, maybe I ought to switch to my glasses over there. Another problem up in this salient here is I don't have, here's one heading over, but I don't have a lot of the heavy long range Soviet artillery available up here. I'm, there's a lot down here, <laughs> and that's definitely helping. Um, but I can't counter battery these guys. Now, fine. I can go ahead and just hope the EW works. Um, but with how low the NATO air power is getting, it's down to 10 now. Uh, I'm feeling pretty comfortable with, you know going up against units. I've had them start passing and not, not drop uh, air power. I think they didn't drop any here. One of these attacks they didn't drop any on. Oh, certainly the guy who died. They, they maybe dropped one on or something. But, um, but their, you know, their reluctance to use air power means that counter battery is a nice defense for me now. A nice way to push things so that I can get kind of the values that I want. Uh, I think I got to take my chances where I can anyway on the 50-50s. It's not that bad if I fail, but boy, it would be nice to, to be able to knock those guns down. A little misleading. These lighter artillery are in range and we're able to do it. Uh, but one of the problems they had is they were making one-to-one -one attacks. So I ended up using more ammo uh, to, to try to knock those out as I get failures and whatnot. Uh, made an attack against a unit back here, and unfortunately I left it a way out, and it moved up to here. Now, it may actually be in supply now, which is even worse. It is, if I don't do something about it. I did a follow-up. I could hit it again, but I don't have an engineer. It's in the city. I think one, one stack... I've got like one stack that can still spend ops points and I don't think one stack can do much to it. One more attacks here in the bulge and I think we can call it because I'm past raid time. I would kind of like to look at this unit, maybe I will. Um, there's no real reason for me not to. But uh, did an attack on this, pushed uh, the unit there, the, whatever was defending back there up against here. Now I got a line up here that's controlling this road that's important. This guy now, had, it, I moved him into place because he was in supply. And these guys did an attack followed up by, um, <clears throat> by a, um, 
a very rare thing that I do, which was a, uh, a secondary attack using the artillery again, putting things at risk. But I got EW for both attacks, managed to destroy this unit. There's a little German brigade. I was hoping to be able to get somebody up into to pin this artillery for next turn or for next pulse or whatever, probably next turn. But I wasn't able to move uh, far enough because of this damn armored cav, which may be what I end up attacking next anyhow. And of course, you know, they've got a chance to withdraw. And finishing things up in this sector, um, unit of the 27th guard, I had a couple of units back here in reserve, had been resting or whatever. I uh, moved the little armored guy up here. Those can be really, really useful. I was thinking about just using it here, but I'm like, eh, I don't have room for another regiment on whatever attack I'm probably making. So I moved the whole regiment up here to block this guy's uh, supply line because that oops is not good. And this way, you know, I can deteriorate him more rapidly. I don't know what to do with this artillery. I probably, probably want to withdraw it. And now that it's in a fucking zone, I could have moved it earlier. Six, seven, eight. Nine. Nine. Let's put it here. That looks like it'll be a useful space. That, it can give me a lot of counter battery support uh, for these guys. They don't need it down here. Um, and I certainly, you know, have enough force to beat this thing up. And then the uh, seventh, which I think is seventh tank, I don't know. I've got a unit that says seventh tank that looks like the wrong color, but I think the East Germans are kind of that very Soviet, uh, very Soviet looking color in this, in the palette. I, I think this, uh, first of all, this may be, must be replacing a unit that I had with the same stats. Uh -huh to begin with. Anyway, um, they punched against this, but we're not able to dislodge it. They got a good result against it. It's basically cracked, but that'll give a little bit of time for me to try to figure out what the fuck I want to do over here and moved another unit up onto the line for the next attack to make it a little easier. That gets me minus one reserve essentially but it gets me much better better odds for, for the attack. I doubt I'm gonna make the attack on the next pulse. And that puts us about there. I'm getting on to fifth core and half gap for uh, tomorrow. I've put in a fair amount of time today, uh, to be honest, for what little time I've had. Basically, all the time that I had free. I ate, I shat, you know. Uh, but other than that, and, and, and you know, went out and dug a, a little pit, <laughs> takes like five minutes and I need those kind of breaks, right? Um, other than that, I've put everything that I could in today from, I guess I started playing at about 2.30 and it's uh, five, my, uh, 2.30, 3.30 and it's five. So, you know, an hour and a half of play, which doesn't seem like a hell of a lot, but it's about all I can possibly manage on my current schedule before the light dims. Sure, I could keep playing, but I kind of need a break right now, and it is raid time, and then I'll get sucked into that. By the time I come out, uh, there's just not gonna be much light left. Um, it's the curse of winter, and it's funny, it seems like it's winter time, which is not the best time to do this, that I'm playing things down here. You know, I don't know why it is. I did the big uh, Leipzig scenario uh, down here, what, about a year ago, I guess. I, 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 I can't really fucking recall. Was it one year, was it two? I, I don't know. Time, time means nothing to me anymore. I, it's just like this burden knowing that something terrible is gonna happen in the future, right? <laughs> and that I have to live through more, more terrible things, um, but, I know that I was uh, up here, you know, during the early part of the year, and uh, yeah, I think it was last year. I don't know, maybe not. Uh, but it's not the best time of the year to do this. First of all, if I'm going to be up there, it's fucking hot in the summertime, 
It's a little cooler down here. It's better down in the basement. It's always better in the basement, right? Well, I don't know. My heat situation is kind of weird. You know how most people or a lot of people have like a cold room in their house or whatever? I have a warm room in my, <laughs> my bedroom. A little space heater that I have in there uh, it keeps it nice and warm. There's just no way to keep this area warm without using, uh, using that sucker, even if I crank those suckers up to full. I can keep it okay, you know? but it's chillier than the rest of the house. And I kind of have to keep it at this temperature because otherwise I get uh, mold up, up on the ceiling and everything. And yeah, I have tools to clean that with, but it's a fucking pain in the ass. <laughs> can't be good, you know, it can't be good to have mold that's visible uh, showing up for my breathing and whatnot. Anyway, that's where we are right now. We've made uh, some gains. I really just don't think there's much I can do here. I, I, I did what I, I kind of could. Maybe I'll shift a couple of pieces later on. But, and, and I've already shifted, like one of the 47th guard went over to join its, its unit or something. But I just feel like I'm not in position. And this is not the greatest stuff to attack right now. The advances that I might make here and up here are much more appealing than anything that I could do here. Because once I get through this bad terrain here, I got more bad terrain to go through. Whereas over here, I've got a nice plane that I can advance on. I can take out Hanover conceivably, you know, or they could just withdraw, <laughs> which would be even better, because um, I don't want to fight it. And then here, things get a little bit better. They're not great. There's still plenty of uh, defensible terrain back there. But eventually, I get to these planes up here, which, you know, if I can make it to there, that's gonna be essentially undefendable. Although that's what I've thought about this, and the Czechs haven't made much movement. Czech units kinda suck, but eh, comparatively. And then, uh, you know, here there's a lot of swamp, and that, that, that is particularly harsh terrain to get through. So, but once I cross the Vesser, there's a lot of this kind of semi-swamp stuff that is just clear terrain for me in this scenario. So yeah. What is the nastiest map of all? You know, for the end game part of the game, I think this fifth core map is the nastiest of all. I've got big Frankfurt, which would be hellish to fight through. I've got this ridge line here, which I might be bypassing relatively soon. If I get past that, things get a lot easier. I know it doesn't really look too different in some ways, but if there's like a lot of pale green, I'm gonna be able to find ways through. They're not gonna be able to build a line just on these spots of, uh, of decent terrain that are up here. And that's kind of the thing, you know, with here. There's places where I'm gonna find better terrain, right? This is just nastiness all the way through. You know, there's these ridge lines and, and they're just bad. All right, that's it for probably for today. Might end up getting some wild blue yonder. Another, uh, another scenario in there, I'm playing uh, Rommel Attacks. It's the easiest of the campaigns and honestly, the hardest part about it is figuring out what the fuck uh, the campaigns are about. They're, they're really not well explained or, or, or set up. Like, I, I can, uh, I'll get to it, I guess, there, but I don't know. What, what I wanted to say is I can remember when my buddy had uh, Eighth Air Force. I let him do most of the work, but in terms of, you know, Telling, reading the rules and whatnot, it was his game, obviously, and, and explaining um, how the campaign should work. And I gotta say, I remember him having some trouble and me just kind of following along, but not really feeling comfortable, you know, with the situation. I don't always feel comfortable when I read the rules either, so that's fine. But they are problematic as far as I'm concerned, and they have not, I don't know if they've gotten better or not, but 
they haven't gotten to the sufficient level. Well, here it is, <coughs> Thursday, and I'm always, you know, it was pretty at times in the day, but for the most part, it's this gray kind of wet weather. Um, as usual, a lot of shit going on down in my street. Uh, but I didn't get enough sleep. I'm up early. I actually got up in the morning. You have to get up pretty early in the morning to get up in the morning. Um, but uh, I'm always kind of shocked at how, how many days have passed or whatever. You know, like the fact that it's Thursday is, is, is incredibly... Like, I'm just looking and I'm like, Jesus, wasn't it just a couple of days ago that I, it was Saturday or whatever? Uh, and, it, you know, in bigger chunks it happens too, where I'm like, things that I thought happened a month or two ago, well, maybe two, two three months ago, I find out, well, like, a year ago. <laughs> and I'm just like, what? I don't know. Uh, I think my mind's gone. Anyway, I'm going to try to play some of this. I'm awfully tired. What I really want to do is go back to bed. But I kind of feel like I need to get this done um, during daylight hours, obviously. And uh, I might be able to squeeze some out tomorrow, but who knows. Quickie. I've got this extra division that I brought in coming up from here. I think my intention is to send it up this way because again, I feel like I'm weak on that fifth core map. I need a little bit more strength to punch through it. Sure, you know, I could just keep pouring more troops in, in here and that might be really good, but, and it may not be this division that goes there. It's probably this one, but I may need a second one going up. So that's where I'm focusing there. But back to fifth core. And those weak spots held by Germans in uh, the fifth core map are not doing very well. Up here we pounded the shit out of this thing. I think we may have pushed it back uh, a space. Maybe not. Uh, I'm not sure. But anyhow we positioned ourselves in a better position. We were, were attacking with just one unit because this is just a two-point defense against mobile attacks. So as long as the EW works, we're okay. And I think we got lucky both times here. Here we did not get so lucky. Uh, no, we couldn't have because I had to spend the uh, air points in both of these attacks. So I actually did double attacks in both places. Um, where I did a follow-up attack with the remaining, you know, with the, the unit that still had uh, um, uh, operations points after the multi-hex attacks. And here we pushed them way back here. Uh, we're draining the damn air points. They're down to six air points left. I'm desperately looking around, you know, for a helicopter or something, and the problem is the Germans don't have a helicopter anywhere near here. <clears throat> They've got a big section of the line and no helicopters. And that is a definite issue. Or at least I don't think they have any helicopters. It's hard to tell because you got the color shift um, between the things. But I think their nearest one's way over here. I did start throwing in some of the uh, Warsaw Pact helicopters, though, uh, just because I don't have enough firepower uh, to do things. And they're so useful in mobile. But once I start realizing that, yeah, he's really limited. He can't hose me with a big load of... Uh, of airstrike, you know, even if he throws his full amount in, and then I'm open to operate, you know, pretty freely if he has no air power. Now the 23rd tank managed actually a pretty major breakthrough. I got my EW, got it on the top chart with a good roll. He was taking five hits, essentially, and it was a question of, well, do you want to die and cause a hit to each of the Soviet units, or, you know, <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to run and try to keep a piece up here that might help hold the line? Uh, this is really thinner. It's as thin as it looks, 
And the point is that the attacker, when facing, you know, sparse to sparse, they can concentrate and punch a hole through. Now that leaves big gaps, possible problem. What am I gonna do about it? I don't know. <laughs> but right now I'm pushing forward. I'm in supply, able to connect back here. This unit was vital to that, uh, to protecting my supply line coming back this way. Um, but yeah, my, since my plan is more or less avoid Frankfurt, it seems like I just, I, I, I need to make these punches where I can and, and just take as much ground as I can. In order to achieve that, I've uh, shifted 20th tank to continue an attack on here, keep a threat on Frankfurt, but, and it's got a unit pinned here that I'm not doing anything with, um, I moved the uh, 11th East Germans who were not yet engaged, shifted them over here. I've got others coming up this way. We got one left behind, back here. These were the guys who hunted down those armored cav that were left behind. Um, and I'm trying, you know, to protect the line here, leaving a huge fucking gap just where, you know, the U.S. built, like, like had the weakest line that maybe they've got. Uh, some armored cav, some mechanized infantry that's very susceptible to mobile warfare. Yeah, I'm willing to give them that. Because I don't care about that. I think I can punch. I don't know. I don't know if I can. But I, uh, I want to gain my advances here on the 5th Corps map. Um, the Hofgat map looks kind of sparse too. But that's because I'm getting such deep penetrations already. Uh, this, is, this is ugly. And I, wanna, I definitely want to move, move units up for it. Um... Seventh guard is engaged over here, so I can't send them up or anything like that. So I think I'm going to be shifting a few of these attack helicopters forward. <laughs> I used the guys who were the furthest back, <laughs> but, you know, uh, I think I'll shift a couple of these forward just, you know, to keep them. I, they're in pretty good pretty good range. I, I just want to be able to reach sort of the edge of the map uh, and no further. I back over to the Hofgap map where I took out an artillery piece that was here. I didn't get the EW. NATO didn't put anything in. Uh, no artillery could come into play. Gonna have limited air points and there wasn't much I could do for this guy. Uh, he's only two, you know, he's like a two strength point defense against normal combat, it's just, he's gonna get hurt. He's just, it's just a question of how big a speed bump is he, and I decided I don't wanna commit my limited air points, and certainly not my helicopters, which are both kind of beat up over here, in order to protect something that's essentially undefensible. Um, but yeah, that got me an incursion up to here, which is getting me closer and closer to bringing this guy into supply. Uh, still don't know what he's up to. I think he'll try to shoot into there. Now that now that uh, now that things have opened up a little bit here, I'm really kind of enjoying at this point. Now that I'm familiar with it, the counter battery mechanism, where you know you knock out a couple of artillery so they can't hit you. Um, you play your EW, whatever. Take your chance on that. I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Obviously, there's some chance involved in everything. It's just such a big swing um, as to whether or not they can throw anything in. But, um, but I screwed up. I thought uh, I had some. I thought I had a couple of units here from 15th Guard. I checked and I did, but they're both fucking artillery, and I was going to move them up here and launch an attack on this. Just you know. A quick bang, smack in there, uh, get some ground, and you know, keep extending things, push, push up against these artillery so they can't do anything, or just keep pressing here where stuff is really weak. Um, <laughs> I can't do that with artillery. 18th Guard, I've committed to trying to reduce this. It's kind of mixed up with 51st Tank over here, which is trying to spearhead up this way. 
kind of figure we're not going to be able to take the French on very easily. We got Czechs facing them. Um, we got Nuremberg in the way there. That's probably not going to advance very hard, but if we keep advancing here across the main river, uh, I think good stuff happens. I got to swap batteries. I don't know what's happening yet with the 15th guard. It looks like it's too spread out in all kind of stupid places. And it kind of sucks because like 57th guard is sitting here and could deal with this guy. Set myself up, smack that around. And so I, I, I would have an extra unit for the 15th guard, but I'm just not going to have, um, you know, I can loosen a unit, but I'm not going to have the capability to launch an attack from that far away after disengaging. Uh, I certainly don't want to throw these East Germans in. They're all over here. I, again, I want to get my, uh, my divisions kind of consolidated. They've kind of outrun their command structures. All right, I gotta swap batteries though. Artillery, what it is, is it's kind of a pattern, right? I, I, I have a pattern I can follow. Now that I know it, it's kind of fun. I like patterns. Um, looking for the kind of things that were problems at work was patterns. In a sense, raid is patterns. You know, patterns of behavior. I just keep doing the same thing again and again and again. I know, uh, you know, to some people that's kind of like, dull. They want to they wanna figure out, uh, I don't know, they want to figure out new little puzzles. I'm not really into puzzles that I have to think too hard about. I, I don't mind the idea of, okay, here's my main strategy and this is what I'm doing, but I kind of like to just get set on how, you know, I handle the base mechanisms of the game. And once I start getting them into a good flow, and have them uh, uh, under and have an understanding of them feels much much better. It's one of the problems I'm having with Wild Blue Yonder. Uh, I keep getting you know oh here's a different random and I'm sure this is part of the charm of it in some ways of the campaign game. Here's a different random campaign uh, mission that you have to deal with, and now you have to figure out you know how you do the pieces of that and shit like that and a lot of a lot of looking up the rules to see well what am i coping with what am i dealing with i don't mind i know i used to really enjoy like an sfb i'd be faced with a problem like a tactic that i couldn't cope with and then i'd figure it out you know i'd figure something out as a counter for it um i don't mind that thinking of that type especially when it's you know trying trying to do something that's just like sort of more of a, um, I don't know, more of a cerebral activity than like uh, figuring out the little puzzle piece of how you actually do this thing that you want to do, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I want to kill the enemy, okay, but in a much less broad sense, you know, how, what, what do I need to do uh, in this game to gain ground, to, to uh, make as effective an attack as I can. And it involves getting my, having my artillery in position already so that it can counter battery. This is for the kind of the set piece stuff, which is kind of new to me. Um, uh, launching, having sufficient artillery in place to be able to get the odds up to where I can actually do something. Throwing an EW in, so that the enemy can't do anything if they have resources that are longer range, like the air power or the helicopters or whatever. And, you know, uh, then once I'm there, it's just like, you know, maneuvering the pieces around, getting the numbers right, whatever, and, and making decisions. Uh, but that's very different from like, you know, oh, geez. Um, how do I, you know, best deal with the fact that, like, there's these cloaked Romulans that I can't see, <laughs> uh, and they might be dropping mines all over 
it right in front of me? How do I cope with that when I'm the hydrants and I have to overrun these Romulans? Which was, that was, you know, in SFB you're not supposed to, they're, they're never supposed to fight each other. But my favorite race was the hydrants. Uh, my roommate's favorite race was the Romulans. And we were like, let's do it, man. And after, after um, you know, with the ISC takeover and, and the Andromedans and whatnot, you might actually have something like that start to happen. You wouldn't in general war, which is what, you know, the era we were playing in. But. And oh boy, do we get off into random fucking tangents when we're playing these things, don't we? All right. Less talk, more play. Here we go again. This is at least about the game. I was trying to figure out how to attack this check unit with units of its own division, just because it fucking doesn't, it's not the same kind of color scheme. It's not that kind of reddish, reddish colors. You know, it's like, <sighs> everything on NATO in the original game was kind of shades of greenish. Everything on the Warsaw Pact was shades of reds and pinks. It worked. Could I have assimilated blues along with grays? That would be tough. So these grays fit in with those others. These glare out. This glares out. <laughs> you know, it really, it's not the same kind of color at all as uh, the other units. And I, I, I really hope uh, in whatever, uh, whatever the final, uh, iteration uh, of the uh, Volhers counters are that they got rid of the color change. Like, it, it, it's just so obvious which side was which in the original game. And it isn't when you're looking at this and this. It's just not. They're too close. They're too similar a type of color. It's not when you're looking at this and this. Those should not be opposed given the rest of the, you know, um, what is the rest of the color scheme in this? Yeah, it's kind of crazy. I mean, I guess it's great for people who have trouble discriminating between kind of close colors. The choice that uh, Simonson made to use close colors, I could see as being a real problem, but I could also see like, this is just a glaring ugliness to me compared to these guys. Time for more tangent in that case. Uh, the guy I kind of mistakenly came to Oregon to uh, have as my mentor in, in grad school. Um, and I just didn't understand what he was doing uh, very well. I, I thought he was doing something very different. And, and I just threw an application. I, I wasn't somebody who, who really dealt with the various people, which is why I didn't get you know, <laughs> into a decent, well, yeah, I mean, Oregon's a decent school, but eh, I didn't get into one of my top choices, let's put it that way. Um, and I might have, if I had discussed research type concepts and whatnot with the actual people that I wanted to work under, uh, instead I just flung something at this guy. This guy was mainly into, um, it turned, it turned out that he had mainly shifted from, so, so he was always interested in sort of psychological aspects of computer science, but he had gotten more and more into usability UI. And his sort of argument was, look, if you design something so that everyone can use it, and this is sort of the Apple, uh, the iPhone idea, the, and all, all that. Uh, well, no, the idea of websites that can be work that can work on the uh, on mobile phones as well as on the uh, on the computer. If you design something as well, you end up getting benefits for people that you know you weren't designing it for. So, like, if you design things that are good for colorblind people, um, people who are not colorblind will not see a disadvantage, they'll actually get an advantage. And in some ways it's true. Under poor lighting, this is better. Under my aging eyes, it's better, right? Maybe, 
in terms of distinguishing compared to distinguishing between, say, these colors or um, look at the U.S. And, and the Brits in kind of, they're not really too close to each other. Where we do have U.S. and Brits, they're, they're, there's new counters for the U.S., so that's not, not very uh, helpful. Um, but I mean, looking at these, yes, I could see under bad lighting, I would have difficulty discerning those. And I could also see that with my eyes weakening, I would have difficulty discerning them. On the other hand, <laughs> there is just a revulsion to this color coming out at me, <laughs> you know? It's just, it's too, and, and this one is not as bad as, as uh, well, first of all, the blue scales are worse because they're not following, you know, the base color. But when you get to a blue scale on the other side as well, wow, that's, that's really fucking with my, my existence. Uh, but anyway, um, I don't really hold to that argument. I don't hold to the design something, you know, so that everyone can use it and it will be better for everyone. Uh, I am absolutely the opposite of that, in a sense. So, for example, are ramps better for everyone than stairs? Well, you know, if you've got to move a refrigerator uh, into the building, stairs are a pain in the fucking ass. But for normal usage with feet, you know, uh, they're designed that stairs take less distance and therefore you take less time walking and it feels so fucking annoying to have to wind around a switchback ramp when a quick set of stairs would get you up there you know, so much easier, right? You know, and what I end up doing is I end up ducking under the, the, the handrail for the ramp so that I can use it as kind of like bad stairs. Uh, that's an example, right? It makes it worse for what used to be the default case, right? Okay. But then, much, much worse than that is uh, the utilization of like, the conversion of websites so that they will work on a shitty platform like a mobile phone. Right? A mobile phone doesn't have a lot of screen space. It's horrible, you know, you, you, trying to, to use like what used to be sort of a full uh, functioning website on a mobile phone was horrible. And so people had to design a mobile interface as well as a regular interface. And now what they're working with is something that works pretty well on the mobile phone, but it is fucking annoying when you're working on a computer still. It's not as, you know, minimalist annoying uh, as, you know, what the old mobile sites used to be. But, you know, you can see the changes they made on BGG. A lot of them are based on, yeah, you know, some of the options were hard to access on a mobile phone. So what did they do? They made those, uh, 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 those actions almost impossible to access for anyone, right? <laughs> like, to do stuff like, um, yeah, there, there's stuff that you used to be able to right click and get a context menu up and get uh, the address for, and they've gotten rid of those addresses. They've changed the way it handles stuff. Uh, and, and so that you can't capture, you know, the numeric part that you need. And basically what they've done is they've taken away functionality that they never really intended to be there, but needed to be there. Like people like me got used to it being there in order to make life easier. You know, <laughs> like it, it just, and, uh, I guess it was somehow either because you don't context click on a phone at all. So that functionality is all gone and it's like, well, then nobody uses it. No, come on, man. <laughs> I don't know. 17th Division opened up destroying this unit.
over here, but then did some follow-ups up here to uh, deal with these artillery. Unfortunately, I launched an attack on this artillery. It didn't go terribly well. It wasn't horrible. I didn't take a hit from it. Um, but it did, so this, it, it did force the unit back and I was hoping to get a two advance and get to here, which would have been really kind of sweet in certain ways. Um, I think that would have gotten this guy back in supply. I only got a one point advance, which I don't have to take, but I wanted to, to keep the artillery pinned. And now I think both of these guys may be out of supply. That can't be possible, can it? No, because I needed to be here to negate this zone. That was the whole thing, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, that would have worked. But now that I'm here, I can't trace through here. So it's one, five, to one of these, six to here. There's no road there. There's access ways, which, you know kind of like roads, but uh, I'm not able to, to get to a trace to, to a major road. And that means now instead of one unit out of supply, that attack cost two. If I had gotten a better retreat off of it, I would have been allowed to advance into this space instead after this one. And that might have been worth it. The question is whether I want to be here and just let that artillery, because I can probably, I'm running low on artillery. I, I had a, and, and to the extent that next turn I'm gonna have troubles. Um, some of my counter battery fires were very ineffectual. And so these guys have a four fatigue. These guys have a four fatigue. It's just nasty. Uh, this guy may be a two, a one. But he's not good at counter battery. These guys, these guys have a four strength, which means they're better against the self-propelled artillery. Uh, I think that leaves me just the 79th. You see, there's units that haven't been used. So like this 57th guard, I may, I may do something with that. I don't know if I can slip him around that way. But I think uh, for the most part, I have the 79th and the 7th guard mixed up in here, and that's about it. And then, will I have time to take a nap? Barely. Let's see, 79th guard blasted away whatever was here, pushed it back, and took up all the other positions. M most of the uh, counter battery fire was in place already for that. These guys weren't able to reach down here, uh, down here, which is where the attack happened. Now we've got these artillery pinned, but a little bit more problematic. Huh. I think my mail just came which is an odd time of day for it to have shown up. I just saw a postal truck go by, at least. Seventh guard here picked on this thing. And we failed in our EW. But I gotta tell you, uh, and I wasn't able to counter battery these. They were too, they were too far away for what I had left, uh, firepower wise. Um, even with the firepower thrown in, I threw an air point in. Still doesn't do much good when you're looking at these big multi-hex attacks. Now, you could say, well, maybe NATO could do the same. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. So what I'm looking at here is a base of uh, 21, uh, I'm sorry, 14, 26, uh, 38, plus bunches of artillery, and I have more artillery than NATO does. So it came out to like 40 to four. So my base was like 10 to one. And in addition, I get a shift for surrounding, three shifts for this, three shifts for uh, fog and chemicals. You know, that's like the whole damn chart, right? I mean, what, what am I talking about? Three, six, um, seven, seven shifts on the chart? I mean, it's not the whole thing, but Seven. It means if I go down to six to one or higher, I get to the maximum level of the chart. And I was at 10 to one, you know? So throwing in uh, four extra uh, artillery and um, an airpoint got me up to 
seven, eight, nine, which means I'm a couple of shifts down on the chart. I was down here, I think. And remember, it's a pretty mild uh, change. So overwhelming force, when positioned correctly, can do a lot of damage. But again, this is a, a fucking division hitting a battalion, you know, in 12 hours. I think we're pretty much done at this point. Let's do a trace because sometimes I, I see stuff that's wrong at that point. Sometimes I'll see stuff that, you know, I fucked up uh, in the next player's turn and uh, I will make corrections on a game like this just because it's so fucking big and so easy to do. Okay, so what do we got over here? We're punching up this way, ignoring this, leaving it open. By the way, over here, you know, I opened up a bigger gap. I did pull a helicopter away. That looked like too tempting a target for them to just run down and get. I don't think they're gonna run down and grab this one. I, it might be worth it if they do, you know? Because then I could close off some units. Um, Cutting along here. Nice gap. Division 9th tank trying to get into, into position to do something coming across here. We still got this weird sort of pocket here, but I think it's becoming less and less of a pocket. I, I kind of think the Germans were able to maneuver and do something uh, through retreats maybe or something, and we're able to do something interesting. Then we cut up here where we're facing the French got U.S. unit trap behind lines, uh, then back to the French here. This is the paradrop issue. Now I have three regiments back there. If I can punch through and get those connected though, that, that's huge, but I don't know how likely that is. Um, cutting along the checks here, making their way into making life really, really difficult for those Americans. Cut across the river, and then this is the main line. We've got a pocket back here. That's going to be painful to take out, but it's, you know, other than tying down this division, it's not doing much. It's out of supply, and, you know, maybe could run and try to attack an artillery or something, but it probably won't do much. Like, okay, forces it to retreat and take a hit. <laughs> Whoop. Uh, coming across, got somebody in the background there. These guys out of supply, but uh, if I take this hex, they won't be. I don't know who's going to do that. Um, I'd really like to get that fourth division together somehow. Like if this attack, it's not in place yet may never be in place. Um, but that may be what I do. Four, five, nine, ten, no. I can't make it with that. It's like, yeah, let's just fucking throw a fourth division up there, a piece of it up there, uh, just because. To here, then this nasty big gap here. Can the U.S. just ignore it? I mean, they've already, they already opened it up so that it was sparsely defended, but could they just like back away from it? Because honestly, they don't need, so I don't want to give up this corner. That's, that's the whole thing. <laughs> like, but if I shift up this way and shift that way, I may be better off and just say, screw it. I'll give up this. It's great terrain, but I might be able to save a couple of units um, by, by trying to defend in that, in that way. Of course, it makes it very easy to get into the final, you know, row of the off gap map. Okay, after that big gap, we've got the sparse line here, and that is working out pretty well to the Soviets because they can create little, you know, they, they can throw a division at a week, at the many weak spots in the line. The same could be done here, but here's where the advantages are. And remember, I think of the fifth core map as the most important because it's gonna get me the furthest west. Another big gap. There's just 
just not much you can do to exploit it. I mean, you come running in and you'll get pocketed. So, uh, some East Germans here, another little gap, cutting over here. So, so what you don't have is sort of the solid front lines that you get in a lot of the older style strategic games. You're getting something much more like OCS, where you've got little pockets of forces and that feels so much more realistic to me. Uh, in some cases, where you're leaving a big opening, yeah, that may be too much, but it's not like you're trying to maintain a continuous front uh, a la World War I or anything. Um, we've got some things in the background here. <laughs> we got this poor guy, but we, we bottled him up good. Uh, cutting down, now we're across the Vesser in the bad terrain. Still haven't broken this open, but it's not good for NATO. Like they're gonna have to, they're gonna have to try to withdraw as best as they can. Get down here. We leave ourselves oh, a couple of engineers holding holding the gap, man. But again, NATO doesn't have a, a, a capability to like just come pouring down and do anything of any real value. Sure, maybe I can push one of these engineers around, cause it a hit. Yeah, so what? Unless I surround it, it's not going to do shit. Uh, come and start up here. A little bit of a gap. It's okay. And those gaps, those are kind of anathema to my way of thinking, right? Because again, I'm stuck in that sort of traditional operational style game, and I think along those lines, and I'm like, ah, oh, I can't let anybody through here. Ah, oh, screw it. In this case, you can, you know? And I think that's what opens up the opportunity for real mobile, uh, real mobile situations to be addressed in these board games in a way that all this fucking exploitation movement and all that doesn't really necessarily do it in the same sort of way. I think you still want those exploitation phases just like you want the pulses here. Okay, coming down. Got shit trapped in the back, no biggie. This is kind of complicated, not sure what the supply situation is here. Because um, there's zones here, so these guys are probably out of supply if I don't do something. That can't be good. Well, now, wait a minute. Uh, they're not going to be able to trace all the way back there. I, I had to clear this space to get them a supply route. Terrible. Uh, we got the poles up here. It wasn't fun attacking with them. <laughs> Don't want to do it again. And I got a whole bunch of them coming in. And not everything there is Polish. I think two of those divisions are Soviet still. And then here in Hamburg, we're starting to reduce Hamburg uh, relatively successfully. I don't know. So, yeah, I mean, looking at the, the board, I think that's what we got. I don't know how much, again, I, I keep saying this, I don't know how much longer I'm going to play, right? Um, this is the end of 26.0. There are three scenarios in this one. Be interesting to see where I got on there. Um, this one also had three scenarios, but they're stupidly close to each other there. And this one doesn't. Yeah, I'm kind of curious, uh, well, maybe I'll remember at the end of the, end of the turn, and get kind of a view of where, where we, we should be, you know, and how well we've done. But again, I've cheated for the attackers, for the Soviets, accidentally by a number of my rules mistakes. But I think even much more important is the capability of one map to lead into the other. And, you know, judging a single map situation that's cut off with, you know, no support coming to you. When there's, I'm getting tons of support here. <laughs> you know, so you kind of have to, if you're going to assess this whole map, at the very least, you'd kind of have to just discount the stuff that's over here. Now, what I've made, you know, I've got a penetration this deep. Don't count those. Those are airborne. They don't count. But if I've got a penetration this deep, would I have gotten that if not for that additional pressure on this side, you know? 
who even knows that? But at the very least, I think you can just discount this. And it's not like fifth core is suffering, like the fifth core map is suffering, the fall to gap area. Um, I've made a lot of ground there. <laughs> And it actually looks very, very positive. Definitely better than Bayor, where, sure, you know, in terms of absolute victory points, this is huge. But again, what do you have to discount? I don't even know here, because this entire punch, which probably lifted these guys as well, you know, I'm, I'm at the point of, huh, maybe somewhere around here. I, I don't feel like I, I crossed the Vesser without the support that I pushed in from fifth core. Likewise over here. I don't feel like I've got, I get any of this without the support that I pushed in from Bayor. And that's all very, very interesting. Like, you can't look at the individual maps and make any kind of judgment of it. And so where does the important map come? It comes to be the fifth core map, which is not looking too good for, for NATO right now, but it is the map that I think has the most distance between the lead Soviet unit and the, uh, the Western edge. All right, swapping batteries and sending this up.